right, FedSmart Podcast. We're back. We've got Stephen Puckett here. I'm Jesse Black, your host of FedSmart Podcast. And I have some great information for you today. Stephen has some fantastic info that we want you to hear. If you're a federal employee and you're tuning in, please do not turn us off. We've got some information that every federal employee is going to benefit from, and it's going to help a ton. This is something that I will say on a high, high majority of appointments um, that we do, we run into this and we have this question and it's important for every single federal employee to understand. It revolves around federal retirement as a whole and it's a pivotal piece for federal retirement. It's something very, very important. And if more and more people understood this, it would really help them set up their retirement to be successful. So Stephen, you and I, we meet with a lot of federal employees one-on-one. -on -one. We do webinars all the time. We have the podcast, which by the way, our podcast last year got 1.7 million listens um, on all platforms, a lot of it on Thank Facebook. Thank you guys. But, you guys are nuts. <laughs> yeah, it's crazy. And we, Stephen and I, we talk to people and they're like, oh yeah, I've listened to every episode and like, I'm what? just shocked because yeah. sometimes it can be kind of boring information, but they it say, is well, important. it is boring, but we listen to it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So. I listen for, they, they usually tell me they listen for Stephen Puckett. They're like, that Stephen guy's great. If you could stop talking and yeah. let Stephen no. talk. And I'm like, <laughs> I, I can't do that. I, I have to high hog the the spotlight the fear, fearless leader man just do your thing <laughs> yeah no so we've got um great information because you and i we meet with a lot of federal employees um we've got educational content coming out like crazy this year uh 2024 we're recording this january 2024 this year is going to be a huge year we've got happy so new year too. much yeah. Crazy. yeah for those of you we haven't talked to you yet happy new year coming into a new year and looking at this year Stephen and I's mission statement and we're, our resolve is even stronger this year to help federal employees be prepared to retire. So we're kicking it off with a webinar or a uh, podcast here. We do have a webinar coming up in a couple weeks, by the way, if you want to register for that. We've already got about 600 people registered. We got a few more spots left on that one. Check out our Facebook page if you want to register for that. As of now, uh, like I said, mid-January here towards the end of January. But it's coming up, um, I think, second week of February. So anyway, I'm going off because I accidentally said the word webinar. But today's podcast, super valuable information. We're going to talk about how to set up a distribution plan from your assets in retirement or some things that you should know about. Because we see all the time, there's all kinds of information out there. If you look at how should I pull from my TSP? How should I pull from my retirement assets? You're going to get about 2.9 million Google results and uh, maybe about 2.5 million different ways to pull from your assets in retirement. And so, or we get constantly, we talk to federal employees one on one, and about half the time, we hear, well, I don't even really know what I want my assets to do for me in retirement. You know, I, and that's perfectly common. That's, that's normal where a lot of people knew, okay, I knew to save as much as I can for retirement. And I knew that I should keep my debts as low as possible so that I don't need as much income. But beyond that, I've got all this money saved in my TSP or my IRAs or TSP IRAs and savings, whatever. You've got all this money. Now, how do you use it in retirement? What's the best methodology for you? Well, first, let me start by saying we're not going to give financial advice on this podcast. If if you followed Stephen and I for any period of time, you know one of our biggest pet peeves ever is general advice over the internet, <laughs> over podcasts. We do Everyone's not ever give expert, general though. advice. We can all be experts with the podcast and an idea. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, all these so-called experts out there. And we read a lot of them and we just cringe as we'll talk about. We're going to give you some ideas here on in a second to also that doesn't mean don't go out there and research and educate yourself. As we talked about on our last podcast in December, when we were talking about it is important to be educated and things like that. But we want to make sure you understand we're not going to give you financial advice by the time that you in this podcast, you're not going to have set up a distribution plan, but you're going to have a good idea on some different things to pursue and how to set up that distribution plan. Okay. Just so you understand that. Do not take anything that we say 
as advice that you should do this and run with it. We're going to walk through a couple different methodologies and ways that people have set it up successfully, but that does not mean in your situation that that's going to be the piece that finishes your puzzle. So we're going to go through a couple different things today and methodologies, and we're going to look at, okay, with the TSP and with your other assets, how do we maximize those in retirement or what are some ways that we potentially could do that. Okay. So now when we look at our TSPs, let's start with our thrift savings plan. Now, remember when we shifted from the SERS system, the older system, CSRS to the FERS system, we shifted from having these massive potential pensions where Stephen, when the SERS pension was maxed, when it was at its highest, 80% of their retirement. 80%. Yeah. You yeah. could get 80% of your, of your high three. Now, before we get letters and we get all these comments, yeah, yeah the you SERS said system, a dirty word though. You said the, in the SERS system. Yeah. Word, it's a four yeah. letter word. I know, yeah. but <laughs> the, the CSR system, what I want to communicate is I've actually met a lot of FERS that are way better off than the SERS under the older system. You know, SERS, the max you get is 80%. I've worked with just in the past couple of weeks and definitely a lot last year, a lot of FERS that are actually getting 100% of their income as take home, believe it or not. And that would not be possible or it would be hard to do, I should say, under the SERS system. So even though the SERS was great, the thing that the reason I bring up SERS is when it shifted to FERS and after 1983, when people were hired and they came into the FERS system, one of the biggest responsibilities to make sure you have enough income in retirement was you needed to save in your TSP. So for those of you who don't know really quick, the, the SERS system had a much higher pension computation, but they didn't pay into Social Security at all. Um, or their TSP. They, or they didn't get a match in the TSP, right? <clears throat> Excuse me. They could contribute to the TSP, but right. they were not able to get the match, right? They didn't get the match. And so, but they didn't pay into social security. So they're going to get their pension. And in most cases, if they didn't have an outside job and get their 40 quarters or uh, anything like that, in most cases, they're only going to get their pension. And if if they did happen to get some social security credits, it might be, offset and you might have the windfall elimination provision reducing it way down or maybe reducing it all together so you're making sense. zero friends that's another dirty one to bring up <laughs> yeah so yeah exactly i'm man starting off the year i'm gonna get yeah, all kinds of hate with mail enemies and things like that yeah. all of this is going to make sense on why i'm saying it though because the serve system a lot of less responsibility on the federal employee. Boom. You work your 30 years, you know, you're going to get about 70%, 72%. You work 41 years, 11 months, you're getting 80% of your take home. But when we got to the first system, you're going to get less pension, but you're also going to get social security. And then lastly, it was your responsibility to save in the TSP to be able to bring your income back up. So when we talk to most people and we say, and they, or they tell us, they say, well, I don't know why I saved in the TSP. I don't know what I want the, these TSP funds to accomplish for me. A high majority of the time, you're going to want some income from the TSP. Most of the time as a FERS employee to get you up to the income goals or needs that you have, most of the time you've got to utilize some of the thrift savings plan to do that. So most of the time, one goal you should have for your TSP is income of some kind. Now, again, we're not saying everybody should look at their TSP as just income. It can be, you know, kind of a rainy day fund as well. We're just giving you an example. By far the most common thing you can expect from your TSP is some kind of monthly draw at some point as a FERS employee. Now, even people that are first comfortable, Stephen, when they first retire, if they live a long time in retirement, they're going to also deal with what? Require minimum distribution. So at some point, you are going to have to set up a distribution plan for your TSP, even if it's not right away into retirement. At some point, you're going to have to. Um, now, of course, that's not including Roth TSP, but most people are going to wind up with a chunk in traditional because the agency match goes there anyway. So at some point, there is going to be a distribution plan. Right. You might think, okay, I don't ever need to touch my TSP. I'm going to leave it for my kids or whatever. But no, at some point, you're going to have to pull 
distributions. Your favorite Uncle Sam, uh, he wants his piece, so he's going to make you pull from the traditional so that you have to pay taxes. And they make you pull a portion, if you're wondering how RMDs work, we on, on our uh, TSP withdrawals podcast, we talk about RMDs and how that works and things like that, or RMDs being required minimum distribution. So you're going to deal with RMDs down the road, but then also you're going to deal with inflation. And even before you get to RMD age, even if you have enough income right away, there is the potential that at some point in your retirement, you're going to need some extra income from your TSP if you don't need it right away. So it's income... not even including the strategies around delaying social security and all these other things that could potentially come into play too. Right. Sorry if I yeah. jumped again. You're probably going there, huh? Oh, no, it doesn't matter. <laughs> okay. I, I always jump the gum and bounce uh, around all over the place on you. So it's good that you throw me a curveball. But no, I mean, it's a good point. There's all kinds of ways that you could need income is our point. You know, I mean, we just worked with somebody end of last year that didn't need any income. They're doing really well. And then unfortunately had some health issues and needed a type of shot that cost $600 a month, even on Medicare and FEHB. It's it's just the only thing that provides relief and it's $600 a month. So all of a sudden, you know, a, a, a large monthly expense that created additional income needs. So the point is you're probably going to need some income at some point, even if you don't think you need it right away. Most of the time, a portion of your TSP or some of it you'll you'll set up as distributions monthly, systematically, whatever you'd like to call it um, here in the near future. So look at that. The other thing is just like when you were working, you know, life happens in retirement and you're going to have unforeseen things pop up. I, mean, I hope I hope I'm not bursting too many bubbles here, but it's nice to ride off into the sunset, but we're still going to have issues that pop up. You're still going to have, you know, the roof that needs repair or one of my clients just dealing with right now where pipes burst and their basement flooded. Yeah, a and, lot of people been dealing with that. Yeah. yeah, exactly. It was frigid cold recently. And a lot of people are dealing with things like that, that happen, medical expenses, and you've got your great health insurance, but there's other things like long-term care and all this kind of stuff that can pop up in retirement. So you're going to need some income and you're going to need some emergency discretionary access, I call it, from your TSP. Now, again, we're going to talk about how to actually deal with those things and have a distribution plan for those in a second, but we're talking about the type of things that, that you're going to run into. And then lastly, everybody at some point is going to pass away. So we want to make sure that the TSP is set up efficiently that if you don't get to see the benefit of it and set up your distribution plan that you your money you know goes to who you want it to go to you have your beneficiaries up to date it hopefully bypasses probate you know they can maybe stretch it out and pay less taxes so we'll talk about that here in a second but we want to set the TSP up for retirement. And the reason we're talking about a distribution plan, if you look at all the articles, you look at all the research, by far, when we're looking at retirement planning, by far, your chance of running out of money and using up all of your assets and losing money, by far, it's much higher in retirement or the distribution phase than it is while working and during the accumulation phase, okay? So in distribution, in retirement, if you don't have a plan, that's where all of a sudden things can pop up and things here and extra income, then all of a sudden, man, your retirement is at risk and you could run out of money or you um, you know, need money right when the stock market just lost and you know had a big correction. And it's one of those years where maybe it lost 20, 30% and you need a- It's Murphy's uh, big, Law, right yeah, when you go to pull from it. Yeah, whenever you need a big withdrawal, if you haven't planned, if you haven't put a plan in place, Murphy's Law, it's going to be the worst time to pull money when you actually need it. So we're going to talk about a couple different methodologies that you're going to read online, that advisors are going to tell you about, that gurus are going to tell you about, and all these different things. And we're going to talk about the pros and cons of, of some of these methodologies. Now, one of the most common methodologies that, that you read about and that you see, if you haven't heard of it yet, is called the 4% rule. Stephen, why don't you give a general review of what the 4% rule means? The fascinating thing with that is it used to actually be far more popular um, before 08, I feel like. And then 
that brought in its own kind of statistics uh, that debunked it a little bit. But anyway, the 4% rule basically says that on average, or or you should be able to take about 4% out of your assets per year, and you shouldn't run out of money. But the key word there is shouldn't because there's a lot of variables. But anyway, what the whole philosophy is, is take your assets, multiply it by 4%. That's what you can take yearly, and then you can divide it by 12. And that's what you can probably safely take monthly. Right, exactly. And then within the 4% rule, then within that methodology, which it's definitely lost a lot of its popularity, but it's still one that we see people planning on or looking at and, um, you know, maybe Some half the time. Way higher than 4% too, we've heard, which, oh yeah, which is, yeah. wow. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I mean, any of them that go above 4% uh, is definitely something you want to be careful of. Um, you know, if they're, they're, if they're promising five or we've even seen 8% recently, I mean, a nationally known radio host was talking about pulling 8% of your assets, leave it in the market and pull 8%. Again, this, I'm not going to go off on a tangent here, but again, one of the reasons that, I mean, general financial advice is, is crazy. I mean, just pull 8% and leave it in the market and you'll be good. I mean, that's what a very, very well known and followed uh, radio host said, and I, I mean, just shocking on the math. And we'll we'll do a video sometime to show why that's so shockingly bad. So you don't just have to take our word for it. But um, I mean, crazy. So like you said, I mean, four percent is what a lot of people are looking at. But then you see other methodologies like, oh, you can pull five percent, and you can pull this percentage, and people just give you a percentage. And we'll talk about here in just a second on why that is potentially dangerous and then also along the same lines like they, they word it different ways too some people say okay pull four percent there's a lot of people out there say oh just divide your tsp balance by 240 you know just divide it by 240 that should give you 20 years worth of withdrawals and you should be good i mean there's things like that again really general um financial and to be advice fair that's with the four percent rule there are ways of getting percentages out safely so i'm not trying to knock the whole methodology it's the when you're all in the market in retirement you're not contributing anymore you're not getting a match that's really where you got to be a little bit wary about how much you're taking out just depending upon the funds you're in um so i'm not trying to knock the whole the whole percent rule but it does matter where you're invested in your own personal situation as always exactly and that's what i was uh, going to say at the beginning when I started talking and then I threw out other percentages and things like that, that even within the 4% rule itself, there's within it all these other ways of doing the 4% rule. And what right. I mean by that is there's the 4% where they say, just leave it in the market and pull 4% and ride the ups and downs of the market. You should be able to get 4%. At least you should actually get 8% average annual returns. Again, this is what people are saying. You're going to average these kind of returns, so it shouldn't be any problem, um, you know, pulling 4% because that's what you're going to average. And there's something we'll talk about here in a second called the sequence of returns risk of why sometimes that works and sometimes it doesn't. But there's times where it definitely doesn't work and you can run out of money pretty quickly with something called the sequence of returns and why there's a variable. But also within the 4% camp there's people like oh just leave it in a g fund or leave it in a fixed income fund and live off the interest and only pull four percent and you won't have any risk but and you can live off of hopefully just the interest but as we've seen um you know years past you know before 2023 and the g fund was getting you know one percent or um you know sometimes even a little bit lower but like one to two percent and you're pulling four percent and so um you know, that that could create a chance of running out of money as well. So within the 4% camps, the the advisors and the gurus and the articles that say pull 4%, you'll also notice a lot of them have different ways of pulling 4%. Leave it in the market or do 80-20 portfolio and you should be good. But again, 
there's a lot of different ways that you have to be careful. And with the 4% rule, what we end up seeing happen as well is two big things that cause a risk for the 4% rule. First is any kind of emergency or, or fun expense. You know, when you have an enjoyment, you want to go travel, you want to pull some money out. If you're pulling 4% of your assets of your TSP and you don't have any other savings, you don't have any other money and we're pulling that 4%, then all of a sudden this year we want to go on our dream vacation to Europe and pull out $10,000 or $15,000. Again, now we're pulling 4%, but of a lower balance and things like that. Um, one of the ones I saw recently was when you pull 4%, leave it in the market. And then when the market dips, you just don't pull for till the market rebounds. And it's like, okay, well, somebody's used to living off of that monthly payment. And then you yeah. just say, oh, don't pull it. And then who knows how long it's going to take to to rebound as well. And so the reason that we're we're saying this and we're going over these methodologies and we're talking about it is because people put it out there as, okay, pull 4% or divide your TSP by 240 or by this much or pull 5% or whatever. But stop and think about that for a second. And now we're putting everybody into one box and it doesn't always work. So for example, I recently met with two people in the same week that were very, very similar in age, and they were very similar in the amount of assets that they had. The The dollar amount of total assets that they have was really shockingly similar, Stephen. And one individual needed about, you know, let's just say $1,300 a month, for example, and the other one did not. The other one had a spouse that made decent money and was planning on working longer, didn't need a monthly withdrawal. And so in those situations, okay, somebody who needs a monthly withdrawal and they were going to pull 4% of their assets, it did not account for inflation. It did not account for emergencies, fun expenses that are going to pop up. And so how that person should invest and what they should withdraw the amount per month is different than this person that's in a very, very similar situation, but doesn't need a monthly withdrawal and may not need to pull it for a while, right? They can be invested different now. Um, you know, the person that doesn't need it yet could maybe be more aggressive based on historics and things like that. So you want to be careful with these 4% rules and things like that. Now, with all that being said, it also depends, Stephen, on the type of market or economy, if you will, that we're retiring in. So there's something called the sequence of returns. And Stephen and I are going to be putting out a video on that here soon, talking about it. But there's something called the sequence of returns that affects retirement and distribution. And it's a much larger impact on distribution phase than it is on the accumulation phase. On the accumulation phase, you know, let's say, for example, for the sake of understanding sequence of returns that we're fully in the market, Stephen. And when we're in the accumulation phase, we're contributing consistently. So when the market's going down, we're contributing and buying shares at a lower cost. But also if the market goes down, and even if we're not contributing, we have time to allow it to, to bounce back. Now, you may or may not have seen these graphs all over the place, but for example, if you have $100,000, for example, and you lose 50% of your portfolio, so now my $100,000 has got to $50,000. I've lost half of it. Well, our minds, we think, okay, well, I need a 50% return to get back to even. I've lost 50%, so I need to get 50% to get back to even. No, no. Now we need a 100% return just to get back to even. So think of that. If we had $100,000, we lost half. So now we're at $50,000. If we're at $50,000 and we get a 50% return on that $50,000, we got a $25,000 return. We're back to $75,000, but we're not back whole to our $100,000. We need to get a 100% return on our $50,000 to bring us back to even. Now you might be saying, well, Jesse, 50% loss, that's a that's a very dramatic example. And it is. It's on the very, you know, worst case scenario, but I'm just giving you an example of numbers that that you can follow. But think of it, if you lost 30%, my hundred thousand dollars is now, you know, uh, down to seventy thousand dollars. Again, we don't return 
30 percent just to break even again now i mean we have to return about 43 percent just to get back to even so instead of returning 30 percent we have to return almost 50 percent higher return to break even is my point now that's the accumulation phase what if we're pulling from it at the same time i've lost 30 percent and i'm pulling from it and i'm trying to get back 40 you know something percent here to get back to even now i've got to get 50% potentially to get back to even. And, and you're so, hoping you're hoping that's happening quick. If we're in a recession or the next year point. it's down again, it might be impossible to come out of that hole. Exactly. Exactly. So, you know, it's impossible, take a long time to get out of that hole. And that's why statistics show when you're looking at distribution plans and you're using a percentage base and based on how much you're pulling, if you're pulling four to five percent of your assets you know about depending upon when you started there's all kinds of variables but about 70 percent of the time we should be okay and we shouldn't run out of money if we live you know 20 to 35 years we should be okay but about 30 percent of the time or about one third of stock market scenarios steven we could run out of money and so um you know now we're kind of rolling the dice with our retirement if you will where one third of the time we are running out of money. And sometimes if we have dramatic losses, we could run out of money sometimes in as short as 15 years, um, you know, pretty quickly. And so if we retire in our 60s, statistics show that we have a pretty good chance of living to our mid 90s now. It's not promised, of course, but as males, we have one in four chance of living to our mid 90s. Females, you you guys are smarter. You live longer. One in third uh, chance of living to your mid 90s. So that's 30 years in retirement that we want to make sure that our assets last. And so to be clear, the the one third of stock market scenarios that we run out of money is Stephen. There's basically like a six year window. Three years before we retire. Three years after that window can be kind of the most crucial window of retirement planning. If we have large, large losses within that six year window, that's where our chance of running out of money goes goes up. And we can enter into that one third scenario where where we run out of money. So that's why there's again, as you said, Stephen, four percent used to be almost like a ironclad rule. Almost it almost was like a a set in stone pull four percent you'll be good and then 2008 happened and a lot of people lost anywhere from 30 to 60 percent of their portfolio and people were running out of money and they said well maybe the four percent rule doesn't always work and again that's pulling four percent but doesn't account for emergencies and other expenses and other plans you might have you might want to pull out a chunk and buy a vacation home or or whatever you have to create something so that's why within the four percent rule some people have come up with that well just leave it in the g fund or a money market fund or a fixed income fund or half and Bonds. half or reduce yeah. it right and then you should be good but again we don't know what's going to happen. So, so, you know, what is the solution? So first of all, one of the best things that you can do is figure out between your pension and your social security, what is your actual take home pay? You know, after your survivor benefit, if you're going to choose one of those taxes, health insurance, maybe dental vision and life insurance uh, premiums, those are the most common costs that come off of your pension and social security potentially maybe your medicare part b there's a few deductions way less deductions than while you were working but there's still some deductions figure out what your take home pay is going to be steven in retirement take home is the thing we want to concentrate on we have an you... article on fedsmith too um and we actually posted on our facebook to help you guys calculate that in case you're wondering the breakdowns and everything else so right how to get an that. idea but also, if you're like me and you read through all the articles and step by step and it's a lot, um, you're like, OK, this is a lot to apply. I'm a hands on learner. I don't do as good reading stuff and applying it. Um, I'm much better hands on. You know, you can schedule a, a meeting with somebody who really knows how to help you. Um, HR representatives, unfortunately, they're so busy. They don't usually help you figure out your net take home. Also, be really, really careful. You look at your GRB and you're like, oh. It calculated my take home on there already. It's it's 
oftentimes, almost well, a high majority of the time, people make changes that actually make that take home pay different than what you see on GRB. So be really careful just banking it off of that, hanging your hat on what GRB says. Or for those of you who don't know what GRB is, it's a type of platform. You can calculate your pension uh, provided through a lot of the agencies. The, one of the best things you can do is talk to somebody one-on-one. -on -one. But so now we're figuring out our, our, figuring out our take home pay. That helps us decide how much we need to pull monthly from our TSP, okay? So then we know if I'm getting this much from my pension and social security and after taxes and all my deductions, I need an extra $1,500 a month or whatever it is. Now that also gives you a pretty good idea too if you can even really retire when you want to because if or, you're going to pull- Yeah, or delay social security if you want to or, or all these right. things, the income gap is really important to know. Yeah. Because now if we need to pull 1500 and I have $150,000 in my TSP, you know, we know that's going to be more than 10% of what you have in there per year. You're going to run out of money, no matter how you invest it and allocate it. And so you're going to either need to work part time or work longer than you thought or change your lifestyle to where you don't need as much monthly income. But now based on that, you know, now you know if you can retire and that's why talking and every scenario should be different. Whereas somebody over here might have $150,000 and has very, very low income needs, doesn't need $1,500 a month, doesn't need anything, they might be able to retire even at the same age. So you can see why it's different. Whereas if we put out there, you know, oh, just pull 4% of what you have in your TSP. And then that person says, I've got $150,000, you know, 4% is not enough. That's going to be, you know, what is uh, 4% of 150,000, about 6,000 a year, I believe, or about 500 a month. That's not nearly what they need. So they can't, they got to make up a difference of some kind. So you can see why the 4% rule um, doesn't always work. It's not great for everybody just to know about. So again, it's okay. Well, Jesse, what's the, what's the solution then? How do I, how do I do this? And what you do is it's best to formulate a distribution plan specific to your situation. Do not read anything online and look at the 5% rule, the 4% rule, divided by 240. The When the market's up, that year you get to pull. When the market's down, you don't. There's way more efficient ways to set up a distribution plan. And once you understand what you need or don't need from the TSP, that also determines how you should invest. The other things you have to be very, very careful of is gurus and people that say everybody should be invested this way. It's shocking to me to see a lot of these comments and questions on Facebook and people don't even ask questions. How much do you need a month? When are you hoping to retire? When are you going to need that much per month? They don't What's ask the money anything for? like that. You know, it's just exactly. Yeah, they just say questions. Uh, here's how you should be allocated. You should be 100 percent in the market or you should be, you know, 80, 20 or whatever. They didn't ask any questions. They don't know. And as somebody that has a lot of experience, you know, Stephen and I have been doing this a long time and you go through like a 2008 type situation and we saw the people that were able to survive that. So anyway, the solution is to allocate your assets correctly and to invest them correctly. So inside the TSP, there's times where you can reallocate, but then there's also times where maybe it's worth taking some money from the TSP and putting it into an IRA. And then we either touch the TSP first or the IRA first. And one of the reasons we do that is, you know, people say sometimes, well, do an 80-20 portfolio and put 80% in the market and put 20% in a fixed income fund. Then when the market's down, you pull your 4%, but you only pull it from your fixed income side. Well, that doesn't work in the TSP. We have to pull proportionately. If I have 80% in the market, my withdrawals have to be 80% from the market when I make a withdrawal, because that's how the TSP yeah, does Meaning it, where... you can't just say, I'm just taking funds out of the G fund. You can't right. do that. It'll leave pull my C fund everything. alone. And yeah. Right. Yep. Yeah. Pull from this fund, leave this fund alone. But you can do that in a lot of IRA accounts. You know, most, uh, some of them you set them up, you can say, leave my stock fund alone, allow that to rebound. So I don't solidify losses, pull from my fixed fund. Again, 
as we said at the beginning, we're not saying everybody moved to an IRA at all. There's reasons to maybe stay in the TSP a lot that we can't even list here. Again, another perfect example of why you don't take general financial advice. Some of you, if you move your money, you're retired, you're not even 59 and a half yet, you created a potential penalty in the IRA doing what you thought was better, but you don't have a penalty in the TSP, you know, potentially. And, and so lots of things like that. So um, allocating your TSP correctly and creating a plan based on your income gap, what you need per month take home. Then we figure out what percentage of your assets you'll need, but then most importantly, how to efficiently pull from those assets to where it should last you the rest of your life, a high chance it will, or there's even ways, Stephen, without annuitizing your TSP, without choosing a lifetime income um, annuitization from the TSP to actually even guarantee you won't run out of money. And I don't use that word lightly. You know, there are ways to to guarantee your income with some in, uh, vehicles and um, investment options and things like that that do give you the opportunity. But there, but at the very least, you can have a solid plan where statistically you're very, very unlikely to run out of money or you're not going to run out of money because you set up the correct monthly distribution based on your goals and needs. So a lot to um, uh, address there, but the bottom line is you can see when it comes to retirement and it comes to your distribution phase, it's really, really important that you set up a specific distribution plan for you specifically, and that will determine how you should allocate. So we highly recommend that you meet with a fiduciary financial professional who can set up a distribution plan for you and do it in a way that's going to make sure that you shouldn't run out of money, very unlikely, or are not going to run out of money. Plus you have money for emergencies. You have money for travels and enjoyment, and it's set up efficiently to transfer to your beneficiaries. It's really important to talk to a financial professional one-on-one. -on -one. If you don't know a fiduciary retirement planner that, that knows the federal system as well, and that's really important. You can schedule a meeting with Stephen or I on fedsmartretirement.com. You can go on there and there's a tab to book an appointment with us. Stephen and I create distribution plans every week, you know, dozens of them, oftentimes a week for federal employees. And that's not a, you know, shameless plug. That is, we really want to make sure you're set up correctly. We don't want to get phone calls from you guys in a couple years if the market does start to dip or interest rates or things like that. Of, Man, Jesse, I'm really running out of money or things is things are really, really tight. Um, we want to make sure that you've plan for as efficiently as you can the income that you need to fill the gap and then also whatever life can throw at you in retirement. You've got a specific distribution plan for you specifically on that. So Stephen and I would be happy to help you and go over all of that. And then also, if you have other questions, um, feel free to also on fedsmartretirement.com. There's an opportunity to contact us if you just have a question. If you have questions on podcasts that you'd like to see us answer or go over, um, yeah, definitely submit it on there. And then we've got a lot of great educational content coming out. Um, I, I got to be vague right now, but really soon we'll be able to tell you there's all kinds of things that we're going to and tools that we're going to send out to everybody here soon to really give you the opportunity to learn your retirement for you specifically as well. So first podcast of the year, Stephen, really excited about all the information. It was a good loaded one. <laughs> Lots that of information. We gave you the, you know, disclaimer at the beginning, we're not giving advice and we're not going to fully answer your questions, but you need to start deciding how you're going to distribute from your assets. You need to set up a distribution plan. Please do not do it based on what your coworker said. That may work for them. Please do not do it based on just an article or a podcast or a um, you know, webinar or something that you just saw online. Meet with somebody that you can trust and that knows what they're doing and you can do it one-on-one -on -one with them. That's the best way to do it by far. So thanks for tuning in to FedSmart. We've got some great other um, episodes coming at you here in the next couple months. Be looking for those. And again, go to our um, Facebook page if you want to jump on our upcoming webinar. Um, we're happy to get you on there. Have a great rest of your year. 2024 is going to be a big year for a lot of people. 
And we're here to help you prepare for your federal retirement. Catch you on the next one. FedSmart podcast is meant for informational purposes only and should not be taken as financial advice. FedSmart, Jesse Black, Stephen Puckett, and federal retirement consultants are not affiliated with any government agency or OPM. Jesse Black offers securities through Creative One Securities, LLC, member FINRA, SIPC. And Jesse Black and Stephen Puckett offer advisory services through Creative One Securities, LLC, an investment advisor. Federal retirement consultants, FedSmart, are not affiliated with Creative One Securities, LLC. For more information, you can visit fedretirementconsultants.com. Thank you.